Uh, today we are going to have a story, an inspiration story from one of our guests. He's called Kizito. So he's going to share with us a story of his, uh, the survival story. He's from Rwanda and he survived the genocide. If you all know, in 1994, there was a genocide that hit Rwanda and he's sharing with us a story of how he survived. And he also wrote a book about his story. So I'm going to link the website to buy the book in the description box and also in the comment section so if you'd like to read the, the story in detail please go ahead and click on the link and buy the book to support him and also please sit down and watch the story to the end to get some encouragement to get an inspiration and also to learn to forgive to live a better life to get the inner peace so thank you guys again for for coming to watch i'll yeah let's start the story Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kizito uh, Kalima. Uh, I'm originally from Rwanda. I was born and grew up in Rwanda, but I lived in different countries, including Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and of course my last uh, stay in, in Africa was Uganda. I came to the United States of America. Uh, you know, I flew from Entebbe, Kampala, and uh, I was part of uh, the basketball team. I played basketball team in Uganda. That's how I ended up coming to Uganda. I played for Falcon Basketball Club. And I uh, went to Boyogere Progressive High School, and uh, so, and that was uh, pretty much 19, uh, uh, 19, uh, um, from 1996, I guess, 19 to 1998. So, but normally, I, you know, the, the way I ended up in uh, East Africa is because of the genocide. The genocide against Tutsis just happened in Rwanda in 1994. You know, it affected me. You know, like everybody else, most, you know, uh, the so-called the Tutsis people in Rwanda. Uh, that's one of the tribes in Rwanda. Even though we're not no longer Hutu Tutsis, we are all Rwandans. But at that time, you know, the the, the tribalism was very, you know, I would say um, it was very big. It was politically politically uh, uh, used, you know, to oppress others. So growing up in Rwanda, I grew up as a Tutsi. I was uh, under oppression. I was discriminated. And uh, 1990, uh, there was a war. You know, you know, uh, another part of Rwanda, and this war caused the, you know, another division in Rwanda, and this is that's where the whole political situation is escalated. So, 1994 was a genocide against Tutsis. So it was uh, during that time when I was a freshman in high school. I was a young boy, uh, you know, 15 years old, and um, I was coming back from uh, from uh, from school, boarding school. So it was Easter break, and I heard on the radio that our president of the country at that time. You know, uh, was killed, and uh, you know, um, when I heard that he was killed, I was kind of excited. Not excited because the human being died, but excited because this guy, you know, we didn't like him. You know, I'd be coming from where I come from, from you know, my my ethnic, my tribe, we didn't like the the guy who was ruling the country because he was always killing us, oppressing us. So when he was killed, I was excited, you know, because I felt like you know now the war is over, the curfew is over. I grew up with curfews, the checkpoint roadblock in front of my house. You know, imagine being a teenager and having your parents curfew and the government curfew. And uh, I need a travel document. You know, they call it the us in French, meaning if I want to go from the, my, the city where I was to another city, I need a, a, a travel document. That is some sort of apartheid for somebody who was, uh, you know, who was young. So, and that's the life I know. And when he passed away, he was killed, you know, and every, to some extent, I'll say some people celebrated, you know, they were happy about it, but um, we didn't know exactly what was, what was going to happen after. And I remember running towards my parents' bedroom and I say, mom, guess what? The mean, the evil, the president is gone, is dead. And my mom got up and she looked at me, she was like, she shook her hands. She said, young man, don't get too excited because anytime a leader of this country dies, we, meaning the Tutsi people, we paid the heavy price. So my mom was in her late, you know, I, I do believe in her 60s. And, uh, you know, I thought she was the oldest human being ever. And I didn't know she did. I, I, I felt like she didn't know what she was talking about because I didn't know she was not, you know, aware of the, whatever is going on. 
But, uh, you know, she told us to go in the living room. She told us to get ready to get extra jacket, extra whatever we need, because she said something's about to happen. A couple of days later, my house was attacked. I was at home sitting on the, you know, in the back here. I mean, in our back porch, just listening to radio. And I heard this loud noise and people screaming and yelling and uh, jumping over the fence. And when I turned around, I saw a police officer with the AK-47 on top of me. This was the first time I saw a gun in my life. So, as you know, a teenager, I need, you know, I thought I can overrun a bullet. So what I did, I just took off. I took off. I jumped over the fence and I just ran towards. On the other side of the street, there was this banana plants, this banana trees, and I hid in there. And while I was hiding there, I started seeing the houses in my neighborhood. All of, all of them being burnt. And, and, you know, the smoke was going up, and the, the grenade was being blasted, the bullets flying. And now I just I realized what my mom was saying was true. So I stayed there almost three hours because they, they, they attacked our house around, you know, 3 p.m. And when it started getting dark around, um, I would say around 6 p.m., I came back home. When I came back home, I found out my house looked like a, a big storm has passed through. Everything was destroyed. Nobody was there. You know, the house was, you know, the roof was blown up. There was bullet holes everywhere. And I didn't know what to do this time. This moment, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, you know, exactly what's going on. I didn't know if my parents were still alive. I didn't know if my uh, my brother, sister was still alive. And uh, what came to my mind right away is fleeing my area where I grew up at. So there was a guy my dad raised who come from another tribe well, they called the Hutu tribe. This guy was raised by my dad since he was like a, you know, 12 years old. So he was a brother to me. He was one of those people, who, you know, you consider to be a brother. And um, he lived on, on the other side, on, uh, 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 like 15 miles away from where I lived, you know. And I decided that let me just go there. So maybe he's going to protect me. And so I took off. I just went. And this is like, you know, typical African jungle. There was no, the highways were taken over. There's no way you can take the main because they were full of soldiers and militias and the killers. So I just took, you know, the back roads, you know, what we call Japan and Swahili. Just, just keep going, keep going. And uh, I went, I got to his house almost like one o'clock in the morning. I was tired, I was exhausted, but I was happy to see me. And he told me to stay in his house until, you know, everything, you know, slows down. And uh, one day when I was at his house, um, somebody saw me. Somebody saw me and one told the militia leader and the mayor of our city that time and the you know, chief police officer and the school superintendent. These were people who were very heavily involved in politics. They were very extremely radicals. And because of my dad's name, they knew my dad. So they did, they just organized, they ordered the killers to come and burn the building where I was in the middle of the night. So fortunately, among those people who are supposed to come and burn the house on top of us, there were a little brother to this guy. In 1994 in Rwanda, you had two choices. You can either with them or against them. So most people would join the gang or the, the, the killers, not because they want to kill, but they want to save their lives. This young man she was, was a part of uh, this militia group, but he was not a killer. So when he heard that, that they're going to burn his little brother's house, his big brother's house, he came and uh, told his big brother that I need to leave or they're going to kill all of us. So his big brother, who was almost, I, I do believe he was like a 25 years old at that time. He was a very nice guy. You know, he's like, he was like, I call him a brother. Too. He's still alive right now. And he said, I cannot leave this young man alone. I have to go with him. So he said, you know, that I should go back to my old place where I grew up. He said, maybe people, people there will spare because they know you or they remember you. But between, but between his house and my house, there was a small river, and uh, across this river, you have to, to pass over the bridge. It was a narrow bridge, and this bridge, this small, uh, small bridge was taken over by the killers. And I remember trying to, you know, we walked, like we, and by the time we got close to, to this bridge, uh, this man, he said, uh, we cannot go there because we're going to get killed, we're going to get caught and get killed. So he told me that we can go around the bridge and cross the river by foot. Uh, so we tried to cross the river by foot, but it was in the middle of the night and the, the, the river was high. We, you know, it was just a little high. I said, let's stay here until the sun comes up in the morning and uh, we, can, we can leave in the morning. So we stayed by the river and uh, in the morning around uh, six o'clock in the morning, we 
when the, the, you know the, the sun uh, came up and uh, we, we tried to um, we tried to cross the river when we were crossing the river the militias, the killers who were you know surrounded we were, who, were, who were on top of the hills you know most people especially africans you know if you know what is called the, the, the country of the thousand hills we are we are hilly country at the mountain country so we are you are either on top of the hills or you are in a, in a valley so we are in the valley and uh, the killers were, were took were all on top of the hills so they could see exactly who was crossing uh, the river we crossed the river and you know little a uh, few minutes later we we are ambushed we fell into the ambush and it was like a 50 people grown ups with the clubs machetes grenade you know all kind of you know uh, weapons while we were trying to figure out what was going on, they jumped on us. They started hitting us. They started kicking us. And uh, one of them grabbed something look look like a baseball bat. Uh, he was about to smash my head. Once he was about to, to crush my head, this guy who was protecting me, he jumped over me with his body, and uh, he covered me with his body. But they hit him, so they they cracked his elbow, and his he just just his his arm just dropped. They pushed him away. And they told him he need to leave the cockroach alone because they used to call us cockroaches. You know, uh, the Tutsis are called the cockroaches. That's a term of, you know, just uh, discrimination. Try to um, minimize us to, you know, to nothing. So he was pushed away. And uh, I was left alone with a bunch of killers. I'm a young man. I was a little boy. And of course, I knew I was going to die. So this moment, I knew I was going to die. And there's nothing else. There's nothing else I could do. And and, um, they took me on top of the hill. I was climbing up the hill. I saw a ditch of dead bodies. I never seen a dead body in my life. I never seen anybody, anyone dying. So as, as I saw the people dying in the ditch, you know, I started praying, of course. You know, I grew up very Catholic, and, you know, and have a faith. My faith, I was like, you know, saying, you know, I was saying that, Lord, I'm coming. You know, I was just prepared, preparing to die. While I was trying to look around, one of the killers jumped and he grabbed my shirt like this, pulled me down, grabbed the machine. And when I had to chop my hair off, so the machete coming, I just did this. The machete went all the way up here. The edge of the machete cracked my little scar open. Went all the way up, it just cracked it open, and the blast that gushing up. So they pushed me on top of the dead bodies. I was unconscious, of course. I was dead in my mind. I was dead. And I was dumped in the dead bodies. I was out of it. I stayed there, and I remember walking up a couple hours later, and uh, I found somebody was dying on my lap. Somebody was still dying. He, he had a red shirt, sweater, and I pushed him away. And I tried to walk. I found out that I've broken my ankles. They took my shoes. They took my jacket. I only had a sleeveless shirt, then a jeans. And this was rainy season. And uh, I, tried, I tried to walk. I walked like a 50 feet. I was caught again. They took me now to what we used to call butcher houses or, you know, it was a warehouse. They'll take over the warehouse, the schools, the churches, and they'll turn them into uh, a prison. They took me in this house and uh, found other people, especially the, our, our, our family members and my relatives. And uh, they would just, you know, pine up people. We stayed there until, um, until midnight, you know, and it took us to another killing site. When I was walking to this killing site, we, we lined up. You line up like you know how you line up going to get something you know grocery store or the food cafeteria you line up they chop your hair off you line up they you know they just kill you one by one and uh in my mind i have decided i knew that i was gonna die i knew for sure i was gonna die there's nothing else i mean i've made up my mind but now i'm thinking how can i die painless so you know easily just quick you know and um i decided to run now i'm back old neighborhood and I'm, I'm back on my own the place where i grew up at i know exactly what's going on and uh, i just took off i was running running and i trying hoping that somebody is going to shoot my goal was to get shot but in order to to get shot that time you have to pay 100 like 100 dollars and i didn't have money on me i didn't have money that time i was a young boy and uh i kept running and now they shot at me they chased me you know fortunately i never get caught and I never get hit by a bullet now i'm going back to my old place i'm going back to in my old house hoping that i you know in my mind i felt like you know what maybe things are normal at my house and i got there of course and i was normal was still destroyed everything was out of order and um i went to my neighbor my neighbor was my mama's friend and she used to babysit us and of course she was a two 
two Tiba met to a Hutu person. So, you know, her, her kids and her husband were still protecting her. But uh, I knew that if I go there, maybe she'll feed me, she'll give me something. Because this is like, a, you know, uh, in the middle of the genocide, nothing is functioning, and I'm hungry, I look awful. You know, um, I got to her house. She said, she gave me the milk. She gave me milk, you know. She said, you cannot stay here because if you everybody's looking for you here, and your mom and everybody in your family, because we are family friends. But as she said, if you continue going and go to this church, it was a Seventh-day Adventist church, um, like a mile away, if you go there, maybe, you, you know, uh, you may find people there hiding. So she said, I, I hope that, you know, I think your parents and the rest of your family are, are hiding at the church. So she gave me the mil milk, I drank a little bit of milk and I walked. And when I got to this church, that's why I saw uh, my family. When my mom saw me, of course, this like almost a week without seeing my mom and she couldn't I believe what she saw. She thought I was dead. So I was a skeleton that time. I was dirty. You know, I haven't taken a shower in a week. And, you know, the bloody face, you know, the whole face was always bloody. My, my hair was always, you know, was dirty. And uh, she hugged me. And, uh, but she said, you cannot stay here. You cannot stay here because if you stay here, you're going to have everybody killed. This, she, she showed me outside. She said, you see your uncles there? They're dying. They have given them acid. This, uh, you know, this, um, uh, this uh, chemicals they used to kill the ticks on the cows. Yeah, they will feed, they will give people, and people will throw up and they will die. You know, they're burning the internal organs. That's how they kill people. So I saw my uncles, my other male, my, my male relatives out there, and then my mom said, "You can." They have killed everybody, every male in our family. You the next. So they're looking for the men. This time they will start with the men. And, you know, the oldest into the youngest. And now I was, it was my turn. She told me to leave the area where I was. She showed me this building, which was on the other side of the street. She said, if you go to that building, maybe you may survive. So well, this building was still being built. It was a brick building, and I went there, stayed there for a couple of days. And uh, one day, um, one day I heard on uh, this loudspeaker, somebody calling out, somebody uh, calling, uh, saying that uh, the war is over, the peace has returned. And, uh, you know, we need to come out of from hiding. And this is when I realized, you know, it, it was, I remember it was the mayor's, mayor's voice. This is our mayor by, the, by that time. And of course, when the mayor spoke, everybody thought, you know, the war is over. He's, he, you know, he's, uh, he's telling the truth. We got out, I got out, and everybody, we all got in front of this church. And uh, he told us that he's going to take us to his uh, office, which was another 15 to 20 miles away. He said, I'm taking you there because here it's dangerous. So if I take you to the mayor's office, you're, you're going to be protected and, uh, you know, you'll be safe. And uh, we walked. So we walked, uh, but in the, in, the, in the midst of this journey, he told us that he has another place for us. So he has organized, he has organized another place for us to, uh, to go. So he has organized another butcher house, another killing site. He put us in this building. And uh, they had this system where they organize, they, they gather people from Monday, I'm saying for, for three days, M Monday, Tuesday, and, and Wednesday, they were going to come and blow up the building. It was easy way, or it's very efficient to kill people. Uh, a lot of people, you know, uh, within, you know, um, you know, with a few weapons or with, with a few ammunitions. And um, they want, so they pull us in this building. This is another, we call them, we call them butcher houses. It, the plus in here and the one day um on the third day we were outside most of kids we could not stay this it was so small it was a lot of people and most kids would, would go outside they trying to play soccer you know typical african kids even though we we're in the middle of the wall you know still we are still kids and uh we saw us on the other side of the the mountain on the street on, on the highway a long line of cars people screaming and chanting saying you know the tutis you know uh, must be finished and, uh, you know, God has given up on them. There are cockroaches. They were, you know, these are militias coming to kill us. I came back inside the house. I told my, everybody, I say, you know, the killers are coming. We need to, we need to do something. Well, you know, when everybody was trying to grab a jacket, something to, to you know, to, just to defend himself or herself, the house, the building was surrounded, was surrounded by the killers. So now it was, there was time for them to just burn it. And, uh, oh, just, you know, storm it and kill everybody. And the most of us kids, is we run, you know. I remember vividly running through somebody. And uh, as I mentioned before, Rwanda is a hilly country. You go, you are either on the top of the hill or you're at the bottom of the hill. 
So we were running on the, on a, on a, uh, down the hill. So, and I remember running and uh, they, they start shooting. We were a bunch of kids running and this, the kid who was on my left side, he got shot. He got hit in the back and he dropped. When he dropped, the impact of the bullet was so loud and powerful, I felt like I was shot. So I started rolling down the hill and I found myself in a, in a valley again. I tried to crawl inside this big tall bushes and I stayed there for a couple minutes. I would say like a half an hour. After 30 minutes, that's why I start feeling like, OK, you know, I'm going to make the day. So after, you know, for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, I start, I heard the dogs barking. These people, they have trained dogs to hunt human beings. Wow. The dog came and sniffed me out. So I got caught. They tied my arm on my back and put a pistol here and took me back to the killing site. You know, I remember climbing the hill. You know, of course, they were taunting. They were saying all kind of words, whatever they want to say, and uh, they asked money. I didn't have, I didn't have anything. You know, the, whatever I had, they took, they, they, they took it away. And uh, um, I got back to this, uh, uh, to this warehouse. You know, where this butcher house. It was the, by the main highway, and those vehicles that brought the killers. Now they're being loaded with my people. They are taking everybody to put them in this car. The, you know, these vehicles. You know, they're. They are loading them with my people, you know, my relatives, my neighbor, anybody who, you know, who was supposed to be killed. And the last car was a small red Nissan Dancer. You know, it's like a neon for the American people. But in Africa, you know, Nissan Dancer is a small, small car. They, they opened a trunk of a car. They picked up my mom, put my mom in there, closed it, drove, and she was taken and killed the mass and dumped the mass, the mass grave. This is the last time I saw my mom. I was so angry, I was so upset, but I realized I was surrounded by grown ups, men. I, there's nothing I could do. But as an African, you feel like, especially African men, we are taught to fight for our mothers. I felt useless, powerless, and I felt guilty. So I, and there's something I've been struggling with for years. I've shared my story. I can't even count how many times I shared my story, but I, and I, it's so hard for me to talk about my mom. Because I was the young boy, I was the last born in my family, but I, and I felt like, you know, I never get a chance to say goodbye to her. I never, you know, I took my mom for granted. You know, most kids, teenagers take their mom for granted. And uh, it's hard for me to kind of over, you know, uh, get over that in that. So she was taken and I never seen her again. And she was down to mass grave, you know, just killed just like, a, like an animal. So now they don't have a, a place for me to, to go. The cars were full, the vehicles were all were full. They said, we're going to put you back in this prison and we'll come get you later on. And they took me back there. And then when I got there, I found a bunch of kids. So I've been always the tallest in my life, but now I found myself at the oldest. I have to make a decision. And I remember thinking that, I, it, it, you know, how these people, when they come back, how they're going to kill us. I was always scared. I was like, my goodness, they're going to just, they're not even going to use a gun. They're going to just, you know, use a machete, just having fun killing us. And I told the kids, I said, man, you know, let's see how we can run away. We waited until it gets dark and uh, we looked, I looked through the crack of the window and I saw the killers by the fire waiting, you know, just guiding us, you know, waiting for the building to fill up. And um, we, I opened the back door and we took off. So now we're going different ways. We're running. Everybody going different ways. So we kept running, running on top of the hill going, and I found myself in a, sw in a valley in the swamps, you know, the marshlands. I kept going, going, and it was swampy, it was wet, it was muddy. It was just like a, you know, awful place to be as a human being, especially as a kid. But I, I ended up finding this uh, uh, place in the middle of the swamps where there was a, a sorghum, uh, you know, field, and uh, it was dry ground. It was a little dry ground, and I got into it, and I went inside it, and I stayed there. This was in the middle of April. Mm -hmm. I stayed there until July. Oh, wow. I lived in swamps for almost three, close to three months. I didn't know. You know if you ask me what I ate, mm -hmm. if you ask me how I survived, so that's what I do believe that a God played a big part in my survival. You know, growing up as a as a Christian and believing in God, I always had my rosary. The last thing my mom gave to me was a rosary. It was a rosary. She hugged me. She gave me a rosary. She told me to be a man and take care of my, you know, other kids. And I took that with the, you know, with the, you know, with the open heart. And I remember 
live in this this swamps for this many many days i was always always you know reciting my rosary and uh I, you know by the end but by june i started losing my hearing you know my vision was blurry you know what was it was just like a, i was just dying you know i didn't know what i was i could tell day and night but i could not tell it was monday tuesday you know uh, you know of course my um my toenails got infected and, the, the, and you know the toenails will grow and it will fall off because the, this this fungus was growing oh. and uh, i remember the the, the the wild animals the raccoons and other swampy animals they'll come and smell my feet and just run away because the bottom of my feet was dead pretty much and uh i was waiting to die i was dying slowly so uh, in june, by i guess by june the whole country where i was I down, got quiet it, it got quiet everything got quiet i could not the only thing i could hear my you know even though my hearing was oh was not good but i could just hear the birds and uh, i didn't know what was going on and i started thinking i'm like okay everybody's dead and uh, i think i'm uh, uh i'm the only one left so i was having this you know kids thoughts and all kind of stuff and uh I think so. On the other side of Rwanda, you know, as I mentioned before, the the the, the rebels, you know, actually, you know, attacked Rwanda from from Uganda. They're now fighting to stop the genocide. They realize the international communities have left us. Nobody's want to help. Now, you know, some you know, the majority of the Tutsis and uh, you know, some Hutus that have joined forces. They realize this is Rwandans killing Rwandans. There's no need of killing each other. You know, they need to stop. So they have joined the RPF rebels. And uh, they now they have captured the area where I was, but because I was in the middle of nowhere, they passed me and I didn't get found until I, I do believe I got two weeks. And it's no. because one of my first, one of a, one, 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 one of a kid, you know, um, who was that, that swamps, he was rescued before, before me. And I guess he told them that a bunch of us ran towards the swamps and those soldiers came. Uh, those rebels came and just do the uh, the rescue mission you know search one by one and luckily i was found i was on my last breath they picked me up and they you know, put me in a, you know in a wheelbarrow and put you know took me to the makeshift clinic put me in an IV drip and um you know fed me and of course i came back you know i always say i resurrected and when i when i when i when i came back and you know, when i found you know i was normal and i started regretting because i found out i was 100 percent often I was alone. I was nobody was there. It's now that's how things start getting worse. Now I don't know what to do. You know the country is in is in a shamble. The, the country is in ruins. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, no, nothing is working now. These rebels, these soldiers, they become everything. They become nurses, doctors, you know, counselors. They they will they be nursing your wounds, trying to to shoot a militia, you know, a killer trying to come, you know, still trying to 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 finish you off. It was just like a those it's, it's like a movie when i look back i feel like man this is like, like a movie and um that's why i realized that now i'm gonna have to face life you know by myself alone and i remember being placed in a you know refugee camps group homes orphanage but you know um uh, boarding schools and you know back and forth you know i was pretty much have no a stable place to stay from nine, july 1994 to and uh, you know um and by by, uh, by november 95 i was on the verge of mental breakdown suicide was the only thing i could do the country smelled like a dead like a death everywhere i was going i didn't have nowhere to go and now i'm still thinking about how can i get out of this country so and um i decided that i'm going to leave the country so i have heard um that of some of my relatives who fled the country back in the 80s in the uh, in the early 90s they were living in kenya tanzania and uganda and uh so i just asked people you know if they can help me to get out so I figured out how to get a passport and I figured out how to get a you know a bus ticket. And I remember there was a bus called Comesa at that time. I took Comesa and I just went to Kenya. I didn't know what I was going, but I had to go. I remember getting finding, you know, trying to find out where my brother used to live. You know, you know, we all crisscross each other. They have come to look for me. And um I stayed in Kenya and I ended up going to Tanzania and uh ended up coming to Uganda. And all these eastern countries, East African countries. The only thing saved me was sports. I grew up playing sports, volleyball, basketball, soccer, running. And at that time, because of now what, what I, I know is anxiety and depression, you know, 
I could not keep up with. I didn't know what I was doing. I don't know what I felt like I was about to die. Sometimes I'll, I'll, you know, I'll get angry. I'll have, have a nightmares and I'll have this, you know, this like, in, I thought I was getting crazy. You know, in Africa, when you have those symptoms, they just call it mad, you're just crazy. Um, so, and I picked up basketball. The basketball, you know, became a tool, became something. You know, that time I was uh, almost six, 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 16 years old, very athletic and, uh, when I picked out the basketball, you know, all the teams in Kenya start offering me a chance to play. I remember I started with the Kenya Commercial Bank, played with another team called, called uh, uh, Trustees Bank. And the later on, I remember one time we came to play at the Kisumu. And, uh, that's, uh, that's what I, I, I met the, you know, uh, um, I, I started seeing, you know, I met the teams, the Ugandan teams, and I ended up coming to Uganda. And when I came to Uganda, and I was recruited by a uh, uh, late uh, John Simwa. He was the founder and uh, the manager of uh, the, the, bas the, the Falcon Basketball Club. So at that time, I started playing Blue Jackets in, uh, in Uganda, but I ended, we ended up splitting. And uh, we went, you know, uh, with the Mr. Simwa, who became uh, a father figure to me. This guy, he took me like his little son or his little brother. So if you realize, I was just not a normal kid. You know, he thought I was a good basketball player. He would give him a chance. He would, but I realized I was so quiet. And you know, I was super focused. You know, and uh, we started talking. That time, I did not speak English. I grew up in the French and in Swahili in the King Rwanda's country. I could only speak Swahili at that time. And the same one who speak, you know, he would understand Swahili and he would answer me in English. So we, our conversation was, I call that it was like a, it was a divine conversation because <laughs> regardless of the, the limitation of the, the language barrier, we all have have like a real conversation. Okay. He said something I could understand English and uh, we became friends. He became, a, you know, he became like a father figure to me. He'll take me back to school. He'll pay him, you know, give him money. He'll ask me whatever I need. He saw he, and he started telling me that, uh, you know, if I behave, you know, the way I'm supposed to be, you know, young man supposed to behave, who helped me to come to United States of America. He said he had a connection here, and um, I do believe he had a connection in Ohio. And he was always telling me that, you know, one day I'll go, I'll go I'll, he'll send me to play college basketball, you know, in the USA. And of course, telling a kid who just came out of uh, genocide and tell him to go to America, that's like, that's, it was too much of, it was too, it was too good to be true. But I, Put, keep pushing. I kept pushing, and one day I went to practice, and uh, I went to practice right there. At the, it's called Wonder Gear, uh, the YMCA. You know, and uh, I remember seeing a letter said, you know, and I could not even that time. I saw my name on it, but because I could not read well English, I gave from a friend uh, who was, you know, from Rwanda but grew up in Uganda. He was like a translator, and I gave it to him, and uh, he read for me, and he said, you know, you know. Mr. Kalima, you have been selected to participate in the USA for, uh, you know, I guess it was a junior team, under 18, things like that. And uh, I got so excited. And when I saw the requirements, he said, you know, you have to be a Ugandan and you have to be this other. So and now I'm like, okay. I was like, God, why you do this to me? So now you give me this, you ask, you know good where I'm not, I'm not Ugandan. So, and I remember going to Mr. Simba and I say, sir, you know, uh, he asked me if I saw the letter. I said, I did. And I said, he said, are you excited? I said, I am, but I'm not. Because the requirements, it's uh, you need to get a Ugandan, you have to become a, you have to be a Ugandan. And he replied in Swahili. He said, Usigari in Africa, meaning don't worry, this is Africa. And I didn't know what to say. He, he just he reached out, he gave me 50,000 shillings, told me to bring a passport pictures. And the next day I brought the pictures and you know, he gave me, he invited me to find a passport. And I, you know, well, that's what I said. When my name Kizito, you know, came up, I do believe, when, I don't know how I got the, 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 the picture, I mean, the passport, but it is, as I said, this is Africa, don't worry. But uh, the Kizito, my name, my daddy gave it to me long time ago. You know, this is a guy's way of, you know, working a serious way. Saved me because he told me that he went to get the passport. And the only thing he had to do is just take out my uh, last name, which was Kalima, also more Rwandan, now Ugandan. 
and uh, my middle name Dizium, so French means the tenth. So I came here with the garden passport with Kizito Dizium. That is all my name. That's my name my dad gave to me. But Kizito, it was more Uganda. It's a it's a more Uganda than anything else. And uh, so he brought me the you know I got the passport and. Uh, you know, I start training with the team, and uh, when it came to buy the tickets, I guess somebody told the the, the the Ugandan Federation Basketball Federation that I'm not Rwandan, I'm not Ugandan, so therefore nobody's gonna, you know, no one's gonna pay for my, I'm not part of, you know, the government's not gonna sponsor my trip, and uh, so I told him, and he said, no, you don't have to worry, young man. You have shown me that, uh, you know, you ha you are responsible now, and if there's anybody I could help, it's you. He took me to the bank. I don't know which bank was that, but we took uh, uh, the plastic bags. They put money, you know, and put me on a border border, the, the, the scooter. We went to British Airways. I never seen that kind of money. He used his own personal money. Later on, I found out it because he had, he had to pay their own trip. It was almost 28,000. I mean, wow. 28, yeah, 2,800, you know, dollars. So, which, you know, which was, you know, I remember I asked him, he said, you know, doing the math that time when I got here was almost three thousand USA dollars. So, this is the man I met through basketball. This is the person who didn't, we didn't have um, what I said. You know, uh, like our 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 conversation, our was was limited, but I will make sure I practice. You know, he, I, I eat. I have some, you know, if I get sick, he'll take me to the, to the, the, the he pays, he'll pay for the hospital bills and he'll make sure that I have money to come to practice. And I never had to worry about scholarship, you know, school fees or uniforms. He provided everything. And uh, of course, I came here, I was, ex excuse me, I was excited. And I remember one day I asked him, I said, sir, I don't know what I will pay you back, but uh, thank you so much. I'll make sure that, you know, I'll pay you back. He said, you don't have to pay me back, young man. You need to pay forward. When he said that, I cried. I said, you know, this is this is a guy that's sending you person. So I came to the United States of America. Of course, I didn't have a high school diploma. I went through Savannah, Georgia. I did, I did my tryouts, and I ended up going to Chicago. I finished high school in Chicago. And uh, when I finished high school in Chicago, I ended up going to university, uh, to the University of Indiana University in South Bend, Indiana, which is the northern part of Indiana. And of course, basketball is a, is a risky business. When I was, a, I guess, a junior in, high, in college, I, you know, I ruptured my kills tendon. So that's why I had this big injury, but I was about to finish university. I, you know, most Africans, we value education more than anything else. So in my opinion, in my idea, I said, you know what, basket, maybe I'm not going to play professional basketball, but, uh, you know, God has used basketball as a vehicle to get me out of Africa and give me education. Now, you know, have every single thing a human, be a young man can dream of. Now it's up to me to make the best out of it. So it was hard for me to, it was a struggle to transition from the basketball, just a normal life because, you know, all this anxiety and depression I had, I ended up being diagnosed with PTSD when I was in high school. I never took a medicine. I don't take a medicine. My body doesn't do well with the medicine, but, uh, you know, the sports, basketball became my own medicine. I, you know, anytime I play sports, I feel good about myself. I was sleep, sleep well, but I, when I stopped, when I was not able to, to, to play basketball, I remember falling back into depression and anxiety. And, um, you know, I, one day I came from school and I was driving, going back to my old apartment, my old place, and uh, I started shaking, started shaking, I you know, blacked out and I uh, felt like I'm about to passed out, I could not breathe, and I was completely blind. I was able to park uh, the, you know, by near, near, near my, my, my apartment complex and uh, try to get back into my, my, my apartment. And um, in the morning, I went to the, to the school and I talked to the nurse. I said, I told her that I, I, that I, I feel like I, I, you know, had, I, I thought I had a heart attack. She was laughing at me. She was like, no, Z, you can't have a heart attack. You too young to have a heart attack. You were, you know, you were very athletic. You were very fit and you were young. I was almost 21, 22 that time, I believe. And uh, I started t telling her, she asked more the symptoms. And she said, you know, that sounds like a panic attack or anxiety attack. 
And that's what she said. I asked him. I said, I uh, you always, always come here for, um, for you know, m migraine headache. You come to my office for just getting, you know, some sort of um, a headache medicine. It's like, you know, have you ever been in any catastrophic event? So I don't even know the, what the catastrophic means. And uh, I, she explained to me and uh, she said, have you ever been in like a, you know, um, car accident or house fire, you know, something very traumatic. And I remember telling her, I said, I was, I was in Rwanda, I was in a genocide. But for her, she could not believe, she just could not believe, you know, what you went through. But for me, it's a reality. That's what I know. That's what I know. There's nothing else, you know, that's what I know. And she, she encouraged me to, you know, uh, to seek help, professional help. She, she, she said, have you ever been through therapy? I said, I've done it. Have you ever been, you know, have you ever done this and that? I said, you know, I tried everything. And uh, she said, have you ever told your story to anybody? I said, no, ma'am. She said, you know, why? I said, I'm ashamed of it. You know, anybody who's been victimized with anything, you're scared to tell your story. You're scared of what to, you know, to, to share your story with people. And of course, being a basketball player, you know, being cool, I wanted to be a cool kid. In that time, you know, most likely nobody, unless I speak and people could detect my accent, but I, nobody could realize I was even an African, you know, which I hated, but, but uh, that I want to people not to ask me a lot of question, who I am, where, where I come from. And the people thought I was just a kid from Chicago because that's what I went to high school and play basketball. That was it. And that's what I want people to know, you know, just, you know, even my teammates. And um, she, this, this nurse, she told me that I have, um, she gave me this analogy about, uh, um, you know, the muscles. She said, you know how, you remember how you come here all the time to get your ankle fixed? Sometimes you choose the ankle. And I told you not, we put ice on it. And I told you to, I always tell you not to put the weight on it. And so it can heal up real quick. I said, yes. It's like your brain is the same thing. It's a muscle. Anytime you put too much pressure on it, it doesn't heal up. Actually, it explodes. And whatever you see, the headache may, you know, the migraine headaches you have, or those are blood of vision, it's your brain trying to explode. It's, it's a signal. You have it manifested outside, you know, your body and that, all the physical pain you, you, you're getting is because there's something inside you, you know, that's pressuring your brain and your, your mind and you need to let it out. And that is the genocide. And she said, can you please try to help yourself and uh, share your story? So, since I was a little boy, since I was, you know, 14, 15 years old, I've been taking care of myself. So now, when she said, I was like, you know what? There's no medicine for what I what I'm suffering from, but I, at least she's giving me some some where I can go. So I remember, I remember going to different different teachers, different uh, you know professors, asking them if I can speak in their classes. And I remember, you know, uh, I remember we had this uh, African Union. Um, uh, student association, I mean, and uh, you know, it was led by uh, I think a uh, uh, Ethiopian young lady called Salam, and uh, she was a friend of mine. And I asked if I can be on a panel, and uh, so I said, you know, just because I want, I want a platform. It was my first time to tell my story in public, and I remember I spoke a couple minutes, less than 10, 10 minutes. But once I was, when when I was done speaking, I felt like you know somebody just lifted like a fifty pound of a two mouse cement. On, on 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 top of my head, and I remember I went to the you know I went behind the, the you know on the other room. I sat down on the floor, I just laid down, lay down, and start crying. But I felt better. I felt better. I felt like at least somebody knows exactly who I am. Now I'm not hiding. You know I'm not pretending to be who I'm not. I'm not trying to show this cool basketball kid at the at the campus. Now I'm just a regular human being. So from that time. You know, I start sharing my story from class, classroom to classroom. And the more I share my story, the more I feel better. The more I start sleeping, my nightmares, all my PTSD, you know, symptoms start going down. And, and um, now I'm finishing college, I'm finishing university, and I'm about to face the life, you know, by myself. And now I'm going to in the real world where nobody cares about my six, six nine frame, you know, nobody just, I'm going to be, they're going to judge me by what I can do at work. Yeah. And now, and I realized I have a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness, but I could not see anything, any pill I can take, you know, 
My body doesn't do it with anything. I never drunk. I never smoke. It just like a, does it, it anytime I smoke alcohol. I always feel like I'm about to throw up. Any anytime I, I see people smoking, you know, weed or using drugs, I get dizzy. And even the the the, uh, um, the perfume or cologne, the strong smell makes me dizzy. So now I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know what I'm gonna do without sports, without with people. Now I'm gonna face people who doesn't know me and have to start over. And I start thinking about the next step. And I remember just searching over the internet and uh, start searching, you know, look, uh, search uh, people like Nelson Mandela, like the King, you know, uh, Gandhi, anybody, because I felt like there, was, there have been people who have been through what I've been through, maybe worse than me, but uh, turned out to be, you know, um, to serve the, the community. And that's, that, that was my dream. I said, you know what, I've been through a lot of my life at a young age but uh, how can i turn this pain into a purpose and we can turn this misery is something just that people can treasure can enjoy, you know benefit from and I, I and of course i can benefit from it and um when i saw that uh, everybody uh googled or i looked you know a search was uh uh you know he, he said it was about forgiveness so tell me about forgiveness in 2003 four, 2004 i was like oh no man no, no. forgiving what People try to chop my hair off. People who abuse my my female relatives. People kill my mom. People kill my parents. And I was like, no, I would never do that. But I started reading. The more I read about about um, about uh, um, forgiveness, the more I understand exactly. It's more beneficial. It's it's it, it, I'm the one who's gonna benefit from forgiveness more than anybody else. You know, because it's gonna ease my pain. Is I'm gonna see things different different ways. And uh, so I tried. I said, you know what? There's nothing else left. Let me just try. I remember I took uh, the paper and then, you know, you know, I grabbed a piece of paper and a pen and I wrote down every, every single name the people, the, for, you know, the people I was gonna kill or I was gonna, you know, have them killed back home in Africa, in Rwanda. And uh, it was almost like a 30 people. These are people who attacked me. These are people who did this to my family and these are people, who, just anybody who was, you know cause harm to my to myself and to my family was going to get it. And the, the more I, I write the names and I'll talk to them, I'll cuss them out. I'll just let them have it. And after I'm done, I'll just cross the names. And the more I cross the names, the more I felt better. The more I start feeling like, you know what? Actually, these people have, have been holding me hostage for years. The, these are villagers in Africa. Some of them don't even have shoes or food. I'm in America. I'm on top of the world. You know, I have, uh, you know, I finished. I'm, now I'm done with college. I got a job. I work for the government. I uh, majored in criminal justice and I was working for the government. I was, you know, whatever it was, I was just, you know, at my age, 25, 26 years old, I had everything a young man can do of. But I didn't have the, what I call inner peace. You know, my, my, my mind was not right. I'm not peaceful, even though. My bank account looks, you know, uh, okay. Oh, no. okay. Uh, you know, I can drive in a nice car, can live in a nice place. That's but I, I was always, my mind was always racing, and I was always angry and upset. And I went once and started you know, forgiving these people one by one. I started getting better. I started feeling okay. I started feeling like, uh, um, you know, something is changing. So and, uh, I got to the point where I was okay. I was fine, you know, I just let it go. And uh, now I start, you know, thinking about, I found somebody else. I found somebody I didn't know. So, that, which was the real Kizito, the, the real Kalima, the, the, the kid who was born to become, you know, whoever I was going to become when I never went through genocide. And now I'm like, wow, this this person is peaceful. This peaceful, this person is a giving person. This, this guy is very outgoing, you know. And uh, I start thinking about other people, especially kids who were who went through what I went through, especially genocide survivors, but still struggling. Of course, I knew I had a group before. In my group, we are angry, you know, radical kids want to go to school, make money, and go back and cause harm to those people, you know, revenge. And I, once I le left that group, of course, they never believed in me. They thought I was just being, I was, I was a sellout. But I, in, to me, I was healing, I was getting better, and I started reaching out to some of them. You know, some of them believed in me, some of them know me. And I remember I became like a mentor. I became a mentor to all of them, and especially the young ones. And among those kids I was mentoring, I actually ended up adopting two of them. 
two young girls who are 14. Oh, and um, sorry. you know, they went through what I went through, but they were three years, three months old. Another one was, uh, was uh, I guess, was 18 months old. And, uh, but they ended up here. Uh, they ended up here, you know, like everybody else, you know, they somebody kind of smuggled them here. But uh, when I heard what they were going through, I decided that I'm going to help. So they became part of my family and I ended up adopting them. And now they're growing. And, you know, actually, you know, they're, they're, one of them is about to finish a master's degree. Another one is about to finish, uh, you know, college. You know, uh, so but when I was raising these kids, when I adopted these kids and I was raising these kids, that's how I started realizing. I was like, oh, man, you know. Maybe must you know God put me through this, for, so I can help these two young girls. But uh, it got to the point where I realized, well, just not these two only. It just be, it was like a, the whole community. I became everybody's big brother, everybody's uncle, everybody's dad, and uh, you know this. I'm working. I'm still working in criminal justice, nine to five, just regular job. But uh, after work, I'll go to uh, to help people, especially immigrants and refugees who come from uh, East Africa, you know, most of them speak Swahili, others speak French, and uh, they were not able to, you know, just to make a culture better. For me, I navigate this system on my own, and I've been here for so long, and I know exactly what's going on. I don't have to worry, and I have a connection in the government, you know, I have a connection in the police, whatever it is, So, and I was able to help, and uh, it became like a, it became very therapeutic to help people, and it became so something that makes me feel better, and I said, I decided that, you know what, one day, you know, I would, I would love to do this full time, but of course, you know, I have a family now. I can just jump and go, you know, help people. I need to take care of my family. I need to pay my mortgage. I need to pay, you know, to pay the bills and, you know, support my family. So um, you got to the point where I say, you know what, I'm going to create a nonprofit organization. So maybe I can get help from people. So 2012, 13, I came up with a, an idea that I can put an organization together and uh, I called people. Center for Forgiveness and Reconciliation and, uh, you know, place where people can come and, you know, just learn how to cope with anxiety, depression. Everybody who came from where I came from or you came from another country, you know, uh, you know, and had a lot going on and you can meet and talk. And of course, you know, you cannot tell people to forgive and reconcile if they're hungry or they don't have, they're homeless. So I ended up, you know, I created some more social services, uh, I'll say branch or your department where we are able to help people find their jobs, housing, you know, uh, 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 you know, food stamp, uh, Medicaid, Medicaid, whatever is needed for them, you know, to live in America. And of course, the kids, I'll take, I'll help them to go to school. So the job, whatever what I was doing, this what I call helping, it became so big and so time consuming that, I, you know, I'll, it, it, that I, I could not, it's like I had two full time jobs. And when I was I realized that if I can find the funding and be able to take care of my family and do this, that would be wonderful. So I reached out to friends and families, and a lot of people started recognizing that what I was doing, you know, my coworkers, other people in the community. And one day, one of them sat down and said, what can we, you do too much for the community? What can we do to help you do this full time so you don't have to do, you know, because you have to, you, you have to do a, a lot. I said, I just, if you can take it, if you can help me to, cover my expenses, you know, I would do it. And this time, uh, you know, I remember speaking to my wife. I said, you know, this is a guy that's calling. We cannot, you know, I, I can't stop doing this because it makes me happy. It's very therapeutic. And in, uh, in seeing people changing people, you know, people changing lives because of what I've done, what I'm doing, what I, I you know, what I'm able to put together. To me, this is not, this mission is bigger than me. So, I, you know, 2016, I was able to find uh, enough money, enough funds to start the organization full time. So from two, from 2016 up to now, this is what I do for a living. I help people, you know, from from you know finding schools, housing, jobs, you know, because of my background in criminal justice and working law enforcement. If when anybody is in trouble, you know, I tell them how to how you behave in front of the police office. Sir, you know how you behave in the court, and of course, I have a lot of connection with the uh, legal firms that I can always refer you. And so it has become, it became so. I mean, it, 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 I don't know how it became. It, it, it's a blessing. It became like a blessing to me, you know, because that's something I love to do. That's something I, 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 I you know, 
um, that I God put me here for, and I feel like you know, you know, I've been always trying to figure out, you know, my calling, and now I found my calling. So, and uh, so I'm living in my life, everything's going on, but I never gone back to Rwanda. I never went back to Rwanda since I left in 1996. I never January, I mean, January or February 1996. I don't remember the which month, but I remember, you know, traveling from Kigali to Kampala and going to Kenya. I remember I would see the Christmas lights or whatever the Christmas decoration. That means I always tell people it was either in January, you know, or February, whatever it was. I don't know how long Africans would keep our own decoration, but uh, it, was the, it, was, it was the beginning of the year. But uh, since that time I left Rwanda, I never went back. So now it's 2020, it's almost 20 four years. I never went back to Rwanda. I left as a young boy. I, I didn't even have a beard that when I left. I was just a little small, skinny, tall kid. Now I'm a grown up with the family and the kids and I need to, you know, I, I want to see my family, but I'm scared deep inside. Even though I forgave these people, I don't know what I'm going to say because I don't know how I'm going to react because I'm scared. I'm like, if I go back there and this guy who tried who, who, who chased me, who hit me, the, you know, with the machete came to me. What am I, am I going to strangle him? I, now I'm a big guy. I'm not a kid no more. I'm like, right? so those thoughts was, uh, you know, like internal conflict. But, I, you know, I got courage. And in 2000, uh, last year, 2020, January 2020, I went to Rwanda. I took some people, some, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the film crew. I took, because I want this to be documented in the case, whatever's going to happen. And I was willing to, you know, uh, to just be myself, not pretend to be anybody else. Whatever I was going to let my emotion just lead me or guide me. I went, and uh, you know, to my surprise, I remember, uh, you know, when I w when I was in uh, in Europe, I was I guess I was I was uh, I was uh, in Amsterdam, connecting the plane. I mean, connecting the flight. That's why I feel like okay, this is real now. So I'm heading to Africa. So not even one. I'm heading to Africa. And when I landed in Kigali at the airport, and uh, I came out of the airport, yeah. I came out, I came out of the airplane. I smelled the 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 the, the air, and it brought, brought back the memories, the good childhood memories, my area, my village, my town, whatever I grew up at, and uh, it felt it smelled so good. It made me, feel, you know, I was I felt like, oh my goodness, I'm at home again. So, but at the same time, I'm scared because I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? So I went, you know, got out of the airport. You know, you know how in Africa, when you, you just, you came in before COVID, I mean, they bring flowers. It's like a party, man. I could not believe because in sense. America, yeah. in America, it doesn't matter. We, you know, you kind of go somewhere. Nobody comes to pick you up the airport. You get an Uber or taxi. That's it. But I have like a, it's like a, man, it's a, it's like a party. I have my, my family members, my relatives, my, my nieces I never seen, and my nephew I never, I didn't know the way, I knew them through social media, and uh, they came uh, to, to welcome me, and I felt good about myself, and now I'm heading to the place where I stay. It was a, it was a apartment, like a rental apartment, you know, hotel type of, and uh, I could not sleep, of course. I was overwhelmed, and in the morning, it's now, you know, I'm excited, but I'm scared at the same time, because I don't know what to expect, but I, I'm driving through Kigali. Kigali is a beautiful, cleanest city I've ever seen in my life. You know, that's not the image I had because the Kigali, I remember it was dead, dead bodies piling up. It was dirty, it was building bullets all over all over the city and, and you know, it mi land mines everywhere. Now, Kigali is organized. Everybody is so clean and smart and very polite. And, you know, the soldiers and the, the police, the most polite thing I've ever seen in my life, they call you sir. And they call, you know, they help you. I'm like, okay, this is this is not true. So in the morning, one time, in the that morning, I woke up in the morning, and I opened the window, and I looked on the other side as, to look the the hills, and for the split second, I closed the curtain right away, because I felt like somebody's gonna shoot me, because I, you know, now, because that's yeah, I remember 1994. You now open the, the window, the curtain. And uh, I'm, I just start opening lips slowly yeah. to see if there's a smoke, there's wow. a, you know, there's, there's, there's a grenade or a bomb, you know, blasted. And it was just a beautiful Kigali, beautiful Rwanda. And I could not believe it. Now I start thinking, you know, slowly that I'm coming back to Rwanda. So anyway, so I went through what I, what I was planning to do. I went to visit, uh, you know, my family members. Of course, I had to go to visit, you know, uh, uh, the graveyard where my parents are building, my family members. I went to my old place. Of course, it's destroyed. It's a ruins. They're ruins. 
And uh, I went to the same swamps where I spent months and months. I went to the same place where I was hacked with the machete. So I revisited. It's like I revisited all my, you know, my, my the my the place where you know uh, uh, this tragedy had you know, had happened. And uh, you know, once after like ten days, I believe I, I returned to to USA. But before I left Rwanda, I asked, you know, just I asked casual. I say, you, do you, I asked one of the the people in the village. I said. Do you by any chance know somebody who hacked me with the machete? Who hit me with the machete? And the guy's like, yeah, we know him, Jonathan. I was like, what? So I'm like, is he alive? He's like, yeah, he's, you know, he's alive. He's alive. So now I didn't want anything to ruin my 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 trip because my trip was, you know, just 10 days I was there. It was a, it was a blast. I mean, it was, it was, it was the best thing ever. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, so, to eat this and it's I, I flew back to uh, USA. Oh. When, when I flew back, and uh, of course, you know, in an airplane, you know, fly, flying, you know, more than ten hours, yeah. you know, you start, you, you, you start, you know, uh, thinking or remembering things, and I remember, you know, that you know, I was kind of going through what I, you know, how my journey was, how my trip was, and. Um, I was like, you know, this name, you know, keeps, you know, kept coming back, and I felt like, you know what, maybe I didn't, I didn't finish my trip. I didn't finish because I went to, you know, to to visit and forgive people. You know, whoever I met, I would, I would tell them, I say, man, I'll forgive you. Don't about, do not worry about me. So I came back, and uh, you know, of course, COVID hit, but uh, you know, through COVID, everything changed, and I was uh, trying to, um, I was trying to figure it out, you know. Uh, uh, how am I gonna get connected to this guy? How am I gonna go? Uh, you know, how am I gonna forgive? You know, just me, this guy. So it, I could not, I could not sleep for a couple, couple months. And uh, in the middle of COVID in, in, last year, last year, in I guess in August, I decided to go back to this donut guy. Somebody had told me that I, you know, can connect, can, you can connect me with him. I, I can go see him. So uh, going back there. Once, you know, once I arrived there, and uh, I've been, I just got told that, uh, you know, actually, this this guy that told me is not the one who hit me with the machete. It's his big brother, but uh, Jonathan is a rich guy living, in, I guess, in Malawi or Mozambique. So he gives money to people. So in, so his brother who's in the prison doesn't have to, to get more charges because they've been involved in a lot of killings. And his brother has been in jail for almost 25 years. And, uh, you know, he's, a, he's, he's about to get out. So it, anytime somebody comes up and say, you know, you know uh, try to press the charges, the young brother takes charges. You know, pretty much he, 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 have, he has given money to the villagers, say, you know, if somebody asks him about my big brother's issues just over charges, just say, I did it. Because he's, he's not in Rwanda. Nobody's going to get him. But uh, one of the guys who's, who's familiar with them, he said, you know what? That's not the one who, 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 who tried to chop your head off. You know, the one who tried to chop your head off, he's locked up, he's in prison. So he's serving the general, he's having 30th sentence for the genocide crimes. And uh, if you can get a permission from the Rwandan prison, you can go see him. So and now I'm in Rwanda. I was excited to go see the guy. Now I have to go through all the bureaucracy. It took me like a week to get to Rwanda because of COVID. I got stuck in Chicago, stuck in Istanbul, uh, you know, Kigali. They could not let me. So and I got three tests. You know, I got tested three times. By by the third one, I was bleeding my nose. It was just too painful. But uh -huh. I and of course, changing the plane and you know paying the money. But uh, for me, I was just determined to go see somebody to forgive somebody face to face because I said I need to finish this so i was able to navigate the one uh, you know um prison you know systems you know somebody somebody helped me and of course because now i work with a lot of genocide survivors and i work with the one and you know uh, genocide uh, you know commissions they know exactly that i'm preaching peace forgiveness reconciliation and this is a mission for now for me for the whole country or the whole continent even possible um so i went to this central prison to meet with this this guy and uh, of course you know uh, I was sitting in a, in a visiting room and the guy came in when I saw him his little skinny you know like a five one so short 
in the first thing came to my mind, what I said, the my human, my human side told me to get up and just, you know, strangle him, just revenge. But Ronaldo says like, no, that's not brought you here. And, you know, but I uh, sat down and, uh, you know, um, the, we, we start, you know, we, you know the, the prison guards start asking him if he knows me, if he know, if he remembers me. Then he said, you know, you have visitors here. Do you know them? Do you remember them? Uh, you know, I was with my sister at that time. And he said, no, uh, I don't remember him. And uh, I said, you know, but I, when he came in, I saw him. I remember what I remember was the eyes, you know, when he pulled me down and the, the bloody sharp eyes. When I saw them, I, I remember I got like a chills in my body. I was like, oh, you know, I felt like he's going to kill me again. And, um, you know, I got up and um, I told him, I said, man, I'm going to get up. I'm going to stand up. And I'm going to ask you one question, and I want you to answer me honestly. And I said, this doesn't have to do with your crimes. I said, I'm not here to press the charges. Just I want you to be honest with me. And I stood up. I said, do you remember somebody who was the tallest person in our area? So without a doubt, he said, Kalima. And that's my dad. And he just did this. The typical African man, he was like, oh my gosh, Kizito, is that you? I said, yes, man. Yeah, yes, sir. It was like, oh my gosh. Before I even ask him a question, he said, tell him the details of the attack. He said, I remember you crossing the river with the other kids, you know, six, almost six of you with the one girl, which was my, I said, that girl's right there. That was my sister at that time. And I remember we attacked you and I remember we did this, we did this. And I remember, he, he remembered that they took the shoes off me and the, the belt. And he know the, he remember the number of the kids who were there, the boys and the girls. And uh, I, so now my anger or my anxiety, whatever it was, it, start, it, it, it turned into a curiosity. I thought I was watching the movie. And I look at him, I say, okay, you know, keep going. He told me all the details, everything what happened during the attack. And my sister on the other side, of course, she, you know, she's struggling because she hasn't worked through this and I, I begged, I said, do not come inside the prison because I've been working with this for almost, you know, 14 years. I've been preparing for this moment. You can come here. So this man keeps telling me what happened in all the details, like, you know, some graphic details about, you know, people, what he did, you know, and something struck me that he remembered that he took, he took my shoes and my belt and he knew exactly how many of kids were there, the boys and the girls. I said, oh my gosh, this is, it's too, too good to be true. And, um, you know, I asked him, I said, man, I'm going to ask you one question. And just, you know, and I said, just be honest with me. And I'm not going to press charges. I kept saying, I'm not going to press charges. I said, you know, do you remember you struck me with the machete? Trying to chop my hair off. And he took a deep breath. And he was like, you know what? We. Now, uh, we did a lot. We attacked you. We did, he never specific, you know, I, he'll say, we are a bunch of us. We did this, we did this. And, uh, you know, I kept kind of pushing and pressing and I realized that uh, it's not comfortable to, you know, you know, to, to admit it because he didn't know if I was there to press charges or, you know, because he only had like a seven years left in his sentence, I guess he's to get out. And uh, even though I was, I promised him I would never press charges. He never believed me because this is the first time he saw me. So anyway. We ended up, you know, I told him what I what I had to tell him. I said, man, I forgive you. Don't worry about it. You know, uh, you, we, you, if you get a chance to get out of the prison, please, let's let's work together to build our country. He said, you are in a prison here. You've been there for the last 20 some years. I've been abroad, you know, in a foreign land for other you know, 20 some years. None of us, none of us uh, benefited from the war. You lost your freedom, and I lost my land, I lost my parents, I lost, I lost my childhood, and I don't, you know, even though I live in America, I want, it's not, I'm a, I went to America because I wanted to go there. I went to America, you know, try to find life. I could have stayed in my own place and be happy. And I said, you know, whenever I get a chance, we going to have to work together. Whenever you get out, and if this COVID ends, we'll get together. So we took a picture, he wanted to shake my hands, but of course COVID, we cannot do that. We took pictures. And uh, I left the prison and I said, you know, I was happy. I was like, I, I, you know, I felt completed again. I said, you know what? This is it. This is what I've been looking for. 
So I remember, you know, driving back to Kigali, which was, you know, you know it was almost two, three hours drive, smiling. Oh, you know, like, you know, all this forgiveness journey. You know, years ago, you know, uh, now it's coming to the end. I don't have to worry about nothing else. You know, I felt like I paid off all the debts or anybody or money or anything because I felt like, you know, someone who, you know, always trying to kill me has or needs to hear from me. But I forgive him and he need to forgive himself. So he came back home and, uh, you know, I was just started living my life and I said, you know what? This thing has to be put in the book. You know, my story is just now, just me only who need to know and hear it or the people around me, you need to put in the form in some sort of a, of a book. So that's why I ended up you know, writing in the book. So it's called uh, uh, My Forgiveness, My Justice. Mm -hmm. Because I believe the only justice, you know, I have my own, everybody wants to press charges, you know, have people get locked up and go to prison. And me working in the criminal justice for almost 10 years, I realized that I, there's no justice enough. There's no justice enough for a victim. When somebody's put in prison, he's taken away from you, but the pain, and the wounds, and the scar doesn't go away. And this person, he goes to what they call the rehabilitation process. By the time he comes back, actually, he feels okay. And the society will never blame him because even if you complain as a victim, the whole society tells you, tells you that, oh, he served his time. Yes, but for you, you have never healed. So. I feel like my own justice I could give to myself it was not putting people in prison, it was not, you know, charging them money or them paying back whatever they took. But it was just like letting go, letting go and be free. And that's what I called my book that my forgiveness is my justice. So I forgive so I can live. You know, I forgive people so I can live life because I was struggling, I was surviving. And, uh, you know, if you guys know, Surviving and and uh, um, it's struggling, and you know, you when you struggle, you don't live life. So I want to live life and live normal. And now, I mean, you know, I just share the whole, you know, I share my story with the whole world, and uh, seeing the the reception and the seeing how people, uh, you know, supposedly, you know, uh, encourage what I'm doing, it makes me do more. And that's why, you know, you know, and I appreciate you giving me the platform and share your story with the the whole world. And I feel like, you know. Africans, you know, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, anybody from East Africa, we've been through a lot. And the genocide against us in Rwanda have caused everything in East, you know, in in, in Eastern part of Ghana, uh, Congo. The, the, those refugees in in, in Eastern in, in Eastern part of Congo ended up going to, coming to Kampala, to, to Uganda, going to Kenya. So now they're everywhere. So that suffering was caused by us, and it need to be pretty much, you know, stopped by us. So, Africans, Rwandan, Burundian, Congolese, Ugandans, Kenyans, East Africans, we need to come together. You know, we need to find our own solution. You know, this hatred, this tribalism, ethnic, you know, as the Kenyan said that, you know, uh, that's, it's useless. You know, the, the, the tribalism is useless. It doesn't make anything. So when we are here in the USA, nobody can, if you meet the American person, and you sound African, your name is African. They all call you African. They never say, oh, are you Ugandan? Are you Kenyan? Are you Rwandan? And if you say I'm Rwandan, nobody's gonna ask if you're Hutan Tutsi. It doesn't, they don't care. You know, if you're Ugandan, then nobody's gonna ask you if you Munyankole, Muganda, whatever. Nobody cares. They see you as a black man in America and you need to live like a black man, and unite as a black man, and live your life. And that's what, we, you know, and above all, we need to be humans. Yeah. So, thank you and God bless you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And actually, your courage is what amazes me because, I mean, like you said, it's just like a movie. Like, I can't imagine going through that. It's it's awful and it's, it's hard and, you know, Many times we share stories and this is not a story you're going to um, like it takes a lot of courage, I should say, to stand up and face this. I have previously done stories and interviewed people about their um, there's a boy that was molested and he was he ended up, you know, going into this whole mess and eventually he found himself. 
So I like stories that have a good ending. You, um, that helps us realize that we have the power to change our situation. It doesn't hold us back. You have your past, but your past is not going to be your future. It's not going to dictate what is going to happen tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And your story is very encouraging because okay. somebody out there that has gone through something similar, it may not be a tribal conflict or a tribal war. It could be something within their family. It is something that we all struggle with. In life, we all have our struggles that we go through, and this is part of it. So somebody that is watching is encouraged to say, oh, I went through this, and I can also tell my story to actually encourage somebody to also tell their story, to encourage the other person to also tell their story so that you enlighten people you show them that this is not how we're supposed to behave as human beings. We can do better, we can forgive, we can move on, we can help each other instead of breaking one another. And yeah, um, so everyone that is watching, if you're interested in buying the book and reading the whole story in detail, of course, I am linking the, um, the link to the web to buy the book in the comment section and also in the description box, but I'll pin the comment with a link so that you go through and you buy the book if you need to buy the book and i also want to thank you for sparing your time to join me and share your story because i know you're very busy i am also busy here and there as a mother i work and stuff like that so i really am thankful that you were able to uh have some time and talk to us and share your inspiration story uh, yeah, so thank you everyone for watching. I hope we'll see you in the next video. Uh, ciao, ciao. Thank you. Thank you.